All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. So, Whitney Houston, I want to dance with somebody. I got a chance to see this on Thursday, and I'm just now doing a review. But um, overall, I thought the movie was okay. I have my critiques. Politics aside, I do have other critiques. I, I, I will say this. I think the challenge that happens with a lot of these biopics is the goal is supposed to be that by the time the movie goes off or the series ends, the audience leaves with a newfound respect for that artist. Or if they really weren't familiar with that artist, they become fans. You know what I mean? Like they leave and they're like, I, I, I was just so moved. I want to go buy all their albums or I want to just look up everything about them, so on and so forth. I don't know if this movie quite does that. I think there's some high points, but I think they run into other challenges. But I will say, I think if I could think of other movies or, or a different series that pretty much was able to kind of capture or, or, or conquer that challenge, I'd say something like maybe the Jackson 5 American Dream was one where it was more so presented in a series format. So they had more time to really go into detail and really take you into the plight of the Jackson 5. And so even though the movie technically or the series ends around about 1984, you leave with an understanding of, of that group. And then it's like, okay, they, they were dope. But you go and you look up their music or the Tina Turner movie. Um, you know, I think by the time that movie came out, that, that helped Tina have a third resurgence because, you know, she had the, the second resurgence in the 80s, but it had slowed down after the album that followed Private Dancer. She was kind of going back on a decline in the United States. Overseas in Europe, they were eating her up, you know, big, giant, massive tours. But in the U.S., things had slowed down. And I think that movie kind of gave her a third reemergence in the United States. And then, you know, it was kind of like they added some more legs to her career. People really, really loved that movie. Um, didn't do much for Ike, but people loved that movie. Uh, Selena, you know, another one where with Selena's case, a lot of people didn't even know who she was until the movie came out because sadly she died right before she could cross over into the United States. She was really big around other regions of the world, but in the United States, she was still on the up and coming. And so by the time that movie came out, you know, people loved him some Selena. You know, they don't even remember her when she was here, but people love some Selena. You know what I mean? The Temptations movie, I think, is another one where, you know, they do a great job of focusing on, on the, the music and just where they were as far as the soundtrack to what was happening in the 60s, 70s, and even the early 80s. And I'd even say the New Edition series does a really great job of, you know, really diving into their experience. And so I really think for Whitney, Whitney needed a series, not a movie. Plus, there's been like 568 Whitney movies and documentaries already. So a lot of people already weren't pressed to see it. It's kind of like, let the woman rest, so on and so forth. But you listen, I just bought that dang reel, whatever that plan is, where you pay the monthly thing and you can just see as many movies as you want. And the movie theater is like right down the street. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go check out that Whitney movie. So I think the challenge with Whitney Houston is when you have some artists that have such expansive careers, you really have a choice between three things to focus on solely. Either you're going to focus on the music, you're going to focus on their life, or maybe their relationships. And I think a movie or a series that does really good can somehow balance all three. But if it's normally just going to be a movie, which means it's probably only going to be about two hours, there's not really a, a, a good possibility that you can harp in on all of them and really have the audience leave without something that they feel that they're missing. I think one movie that may have been able to do that might have been the Natalie Cole one where there was a good balance of her life relationships in the music. But I, I do think they left out some of the music, in my opinion, on that one. Um, the critique I had with the Janet documentary was that I thought they spent too much time on her relationships, not enough time on her music. And I, I, I feel like that's where they dropped the ball at the documentary. There was so much that could have been said, especially in regards to the fact that a lot of people, when they look at somebody like Janet, she's often kind of seen as, okay, well, she's only famous because she's Michael's sister and blah, 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 blah. And so I feel like the documentary, that was the perfect opportunity for her to kind of solidify why she was able to have staying power. Yes, her being a Jackson got her in the door, but she had to do something to stay there. And I think they spent too much time on Jermaine Dupree and Renee and, and the, the bars guy. It was like, all right, we get it. I would have spent more time on the tours and the music. So with this Whitney movie, they tried to do all three. But I think the problem is because this probably should have been a series and not a movie, there's almost like a void that's missing in all three elements. And really, the only one most people really wanted to hear about was really the music, I think, for most folks. At this point, we've heard every story about Bobby. We've heard every story about the drugs. And again, like I said, they've already had 562 Whitney movies and documentaries. So this, in my opinion, the goal of this should have been let's solidify her legacy. Let's, let's lock in just the impact with the music. And I think there, there's bits and pieces that are there, but it kind of, the script, in my opinion, just there, there were holes in it. I will say, as far as the execution of what was presented, I will say the lead actress, Naomi, I thought she won me over halfway through, because I'm not going to lie. I came in there with a strong side eye, because I was like, of all people to cast, this is the choice y'all went with, huh? Okay. All right. And, and to be fair, 
I think there are some entertainers that are already hard to just capture. I said this about the Tony Braxton movie. It's really hard to capture the essence of somebody like a Tony Braxton. Even though I think Tony and her people were, you know, pretty much locked in with that movie, um, I didn't quite think that the actress that, that played Tony really had Tony down like that, at least for me. Um, and I think with Whitney, again, Whitney's a hard person to capture the essence of. That, there was just something unique about her. The same thing I was saying about Black Panther and all of the, the conversations around Chadwick. It was like Chadwick was just somebody that was so special, so unique. That was going to be, those, those were going to be some hard shoes to fill. Anyway, my biggest critique of the movie, um, and I'm going to get to the good stuff. I'm just trying to get all the stuff that I had some smoke for first out the way. Um, I, the biggest critique, I think, that I had with the plot line is that they kept mixing up all the errors. As a Whitney fan, bam, it was killing me softly to just kind of see how everything just jumped everywhere. So even with the music, like there was, there was a portion, because um, it, it, it wasn't just the music, it was also even like sometimes how she looked or what was happening. It was like they just put everything from about 86 to about 98 in a blender and, and then spit it back out and turned it into a movie. And so in some moments she'd be in the studio and it's her telling Clive Davis that she doesn't want to record why does it hurt so bad for her debut album? And I'm like, that song wasn't recorded until the mid '90s. Like, why? This is okay. Um, or even like, where do broken hearts go? The idea of that, you know, they were recording that for the first album. I'm like, y'all are mixing the albums up at this point, which was kind of throwing me off. Or even when she went on tour for My Love Is Your Love, but then when you saw the imaging of how she looked, it was kind of the imaging that she had for the I'm Your Baby Tonight era. So, you know, it's supposed to be 1999, and now she looks like 1990 again. Like, they just kept going back and forth, and so that was throwing me off. Or even, um, there's a portion... Oh, I forgot to tell y'all, there's spoilers in this, my bad. Um, or even the portion where she's performing I Want to Dance with Somebody, but they're using the, the performance from when she does the Arista, you know, I think it was the 25th anniversary or 20th anniversary special. Um, and so that's like 1990, but I Want to Dance with Somebody was 87. So it was like they just had different things, you know, kind of all over. That was driving me crazy because I really think, again, when I saw that, I knew, okay, the emphasis on this movie is not going to really be about the music. They're going to really try to somehow tackle music relationships in her life all in one together and somehow make this a super movie. But I think you, you end up losing bits and pieces that are important. Like, I really feel that album eras up until the early 2000s were still really important. And so with this, you don't really get a sense of the album eras because it's all kind of a big giant blur. Um, and I think that's what led into my second critique would have been, I wish there would have been more emphasis on her impact. Because I don't think you leave the movie really understanding just how truly big she was. Literally on Twitter the other day, I saw somebody post something about like Whitney Houston wasn't jumping until The Bodyguard. And I don't think people realize Whitney before The Bodyguard was already this blockbuster superstar, right? You know, her debut album sells like 20 million, million copies. The, the follow-up, Whitney sells, you know, a little bit less, but still sells a whole bunch of records. Um, and again, seven consecutive number one singles, all, all these big massive things. And that was all before The Bodyguard. And, and, and I feel like there, there were three moments that really made Whitney like blow up. Yes, it's the, the early era with the first two albums. I'm Your Baby Tonight is kind of the slowdown because they centered a bit more on R&B, so the pop audiences weren't as receptive. But, you know, that debut album and Whitney both were like era number one. Number two to me would have been that national anthem. In my opinion, that was something that just kicked the door down and then to kick it into the next, next year, we get the bodyguard. But, you know, I don't think people realize, like when you're looking back at, at Whitney, Coming into those mid-80s, Whitney ended up becoming one of the first superstars to come out of the 80s that was a black woman. Because again, I don't want to dive into all of my, my musical politics, but if you've seen some of my other videos, whether it's the R&B is Dead series or even my So What Happened with Janet, we talk about how coming into the 80s, black music was pretty much under attack by mainstream audiences. That whole disco sucks era movement turned into pretty much let's just go after black music black music really suffered until honestly you know michael jackson comes with, out with thriller but even with that it wasn't like thriller opened the floodgate and then mtv and, and radio was receptive to black music again it was a process and so for me whitney was the face uh, of somebody who was able to really you know overcome that whole dark era of when everybody decided that black music was no longer marketable to, to mainstream audiences. She was the first to really emerge out of that and become a massive superstar. Because I think up until then, 
coming into the 80s, you still had your, your, your seasoned entertainers, Dianas and Gladys and, and, and Tina and, and Natalie and all of them, but all of them were on a decline. Uh, I'm, maybe minus Tina, but all of them were on a decline. There wasn't anybody to really emerge and come out and like just kick doors down where you had Whitney doing like Diet Coke commercials and stuff like that. That wasn't something that a lot of the, the black entertainers, especially the women between about 81 and 84, had access to in that moment because again, there was this movement to kind of just silence black music and radio programmers were afraid to play anything with too much kick, too much grit because they were afraid it would have the, you know, people, audiences would associate that with the whole Disco Sucks era and then more backlash. So there was like a, a period of like dark ages in music for a quick minute with black music. I talk about it in my So What Happened with Janet in a lot more detail with like numbers and stuff. So if you were really pressed about that conversation, see that video. But anyway, getting to my point, like when you talk about those 80s, in my opinion, you had the three entertainers that really kicked the door in um, as far as who would be the, the main superstars of that era. You have Madonna, who, you know, she, she makes her emergence. And then you, well, Janet came out first, but Madonna blew up first. So it was like Madonna, and then Whitney just became Whitney, and then Janet comes out. But I think when Whitney got into that Whitney space, like, it was like, man, this, this is crazy. Like, when you talk about the faces of the MTV generation, you know, it's, it's Whitney, it's Madonna, it's Prince, it's Michael, it's Janet. You could even throw Mariah in there a little bit later. But Whitney had a massive impact. And I don't know if the movie really captures that because a lot of her accolades, they zipped right through. They zipped right through all the number one singles, which again, like we just said, in that point in time, black music was really getting its behind kick. So for her to come out in 85 and just rack up number one after number one after number one after number one, when there hadn't even been that many black artists in general to have any number one singles other than, you know, Prince, Michael, uh, Diana, and, 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 and John, uh, Lionel with Endless Love some years earlier and stuff, there weren't a lot of black artists that were racking up number one hits on the Billboard Hot 100 at the time. So for Whitney to come and, and just storm in, like, she was a movement. And I don't know if they really get that, you know? Um, and so that was something that was interesting to me. And please don't take that as me saying that black artists were not getting number one hits before Whitney. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is there was a period coming as a result of the Disco Sucks movement and the entire movement to kind of shut down and slow down the commercial success of black music that between about, we're gonna say about 1980 to 85, a lot of black artists had a really, really hard time crossing over to mainstream audiences. Uh, on, in the R&B world, we, we was having the hits. We was jamming. The rest of the world missed out. Sucks for them. Um, and then they finally decided to play catch up and get back with the program after about 85. So that's what we're saying. Anyway, getting more back, more so back to the movie. One of the things that I really found interesting right in the beginning of the movie is when the mom, Sissy, which by the way, I will say whoever they had playing Sissy, she had Sissy down. I really felt like that was Sissy in the movie. So that part was good to me. Um, the emphasis on her enunciating the words. I found that hilarious because if you look at Whitney, like, I've always said Whitney enunciates every word, even when she's talking. So she does it with singing. She was really good with the diction, but even when she speaks, she enunciates every syllable. So even when she was cussing out Wendy Williams on the radio show, while Wendy was getting cussed out, Whitney pronounced every syllable, said the end of every word. Like, I just found that hilarious. So I was like, yeah, that, that, that part was very interesting. So I was like, yeah, Whitney enunciates everything. Like, go and listen to any interview, watch any performance. She is going to, you know, enunciate each and every syllable of the word and still do it with some soul. Okay, I'm like, all right, dope. Um, I found it interesting. They jumped right into Robin right away. Like, Robin was in the first five minutes of the movie because I was wondering if she'd be mentioned or not. I was like, oh, we'll see. But yeah, they had Robin in there. But I, I do think it's interesting how they kind of... Robin's exit to me... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe because I also read Robin's book. It goes back to what I was saying as far as like how there were sometimes loopholes or voids with certain elements. When it came to the relationships, I did feel like Robin and, and Bobby... Um, I don't know. I'm not that pressed about their stories, but if you're going to put their stories in there, put them in there right at least. That's how I kind of looked at it. I think Robin, they had her down in the first half, and then second half, it was kind of like, all right, phase her out of here next. Um, so I found that interesting. I love the part where Whitney was saying to Clyde that she wanted to have great big songs. Um, because when you think about it, up in between the first album through About the Bodyguard, a lot of her songs were very, very big. It's, and when I say big, like big production, lots of belting, just a big, bright sound. You know, whether it be an up-tempo, whether it be a slow jam, you know, the songs were very, very big. And I think as she got into the 90s, she kind of started experimenting a bit more artistically. But I love that they had that because I think that's what I think of Whitney, especially in those early years, like the very, very big songs. So I love that. Um, what I thought was clever that they did with the singing, because I was wondering how this was going to go, because there's not too many people that can sing like Whitney. 
Um, it looks like from what I heard that, you know, they'd have the actress singing some portions and they would do the mixing where you kind of gradually mix Whitney's voice into it and you didn't even realize it switched from Naomi's voice to Whitney's if that was Naomi singing. Um, so really like, you know, if there was anything with like her on a piano, acapella, rehearsing or something, it would be Naomi. And if they transition into her being on the stage, you know, maybe Naomi is singing at the beginning of a verse and as it got into that Whitney element where the, the power notes and stuff start coming out, it would transition into Whitney's voice, which which I loved. I thought it was really smart to keep Whitney's actual voice in the movie as far as the music because that's the thing that made Whitney Whitney. Whitney was the voice. So let's make sure we hear the voice. So that was good. Um, well, it was interesting too. Um, I, I did catch the part when um, they were going over the demos over for the first album and they were playing like that version of How Will I Know and it was this very light whimsical version you're like oh thank god Whitney got it because it's interesting because remember How Will I Know was supposed to be Janice that was supposed to go on control so if there was a, a choice that I'm glad went down I'm so glad that Whitney got that song because it, I'm wondering if like that demo version they were playing was supposed to be reminiscent of how it would have sounded had they given it to Janet um, so I really enjoyed that part that was funny um Something that was interesting because they also did highlight, you know, Whitney getting booed at the Soul Train Awards. I think one thing people forget, Whitney actually got booed two years in a row. So she got booed at the 88 one, right? Um, that's when she was nominated. Um, but I think Janet had won the award, but they had booed that one because that was when they were playing like the I Want to Dance with Somebody. And then the next year at 89 when she was actually there, you know, the Where Do Broken Hearts Go? Um, you know, was the song that was nominated and the boos were even louder. I was like, that's crazy. But I think... You know, it goes back to this conversation that some people have had about whether she made music for white people or so on and so forth. And I think looking back, it wasn't even to me necessarily the music. I always thought it was more so the imaging of how they tried to push her. Because again, going back to our conversation about how people were afraid of black music and stuff being a little too black in those early, early 80s. They made an effort to try to make her universal when she came out. You know, paint her to be the Barbie doll, the princess. Because even I remember them saying, you know, with the debut album, they weren't sure about the cover because they thought she looked a little too ethnic. I'm like, here y'all go. Um, but I, I, if I can remember, I mean, I wasn't really quite around like that yet. I was too young. But, you know, listening to other people, from what people have told me, they were saying Whitney didn't get a lot of smoke and critique about not being black enough until the second album. Like the first album, people still, you know, she was still pretty much well recepted by um, black audiences, you know, because like Saving All My Love For You and, you know, all those great songs like that or, or, or uh, You Give Good Love and everything like that. There was still a respect for her. And I think as you got into the Whitney era, people still loved her music, but I think the era and the imaging went a little bit more commercial. Um, and so I just think if you look at what was happening at the time, like New Jack Swing is coming out, you know, there, there's a bunch of different shifts. So when I was watching the clip of, you know, the 88 Soul Train Awards, 88 or 89, I'm sorry, the 89 Soul Train Awards when they're booing her that time, like think about how different music was by 89 just compared to 87. Because remember, Whitney comes out in 87. When they're showing Where Do Broken Hearts Go, I think that, that was the last single for that album. Um, that was also a number one as well. But, you know, Where Do Broken Hearts Go in a room with something like Bobby Brown, every little step I take. You know what I mean? Just It's such a different dynamic musically. Like, music was just going through a shift. And so I think Whitney caught some smoke in that second era just because, yeah, they the imaging kind of pushed her to be a lot more commercial. And some folks felt like she had sold out. And, and me, personally, I just think it was more so the labels doing. And they didn't, they, they didn't read the room. You know, and I think that's why she got some of the smoke that she got because Whitney to me was always still Whitney. But also I was too young to remember this. My earliest memories of Whitney would be the I'm Your Baby Tonight era. I was too young to remember um, the Whitney era and I wasn't even around for the first era. But um, I, I don't know. I, looking at her, the, the experience as far as the conversation of whether her music was black or not, it kind of reminds me of how Lizzo gets treated now. And I think that's because traditionally with black artists that get the luxury to cross over you normally see them in the r&b realms first and then they cross over into pop with lizzo i always thought lizzo came right in through the pop market they pushed her right into pop and so it's kind of put her in a space where she gets unfair critique because even the first time i ever heard or saw lizzo it was on the ellen show i'm like who is this why don't i know about her yet because uh, you know normally you hear these kind of artists on like the r&b radio and then they cross over so i think with whitney um whitney sometimes got unnecessary smoke because of her success but, you know, fortunately, I think she was able to win over crowds and people got to know the real her once they let Whitney just be herself. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just think it goes back to just, you know, the label's choice as far as imaging. By the way, just to be honest, Where Do Broken Hearts Go is probably one of my least favorite Whitney singles. To me, it just, it just 
represents the old guard of those droopy 80s ballads. I, think I might have been booing in the crowd, too, to be honest, had I been around. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, um, yeah, I, I, I never really cared for that song like that. I mean, good for her for being number one, but I, I that, that's the one nippy song I'd be skipping. Like, you don't got to ever worry about me playing that one. Um, I, I kind of talked about the national anthem already, but what I thought was really clever with the movie, there's been this clip that's kind of viral that's been going around where it's a, a family at their house, like this black guy and his friends. I don't know if it was like they were having dinner or they, I don't remember what, but you know, everybody's at the house chilling and on the TV is Whitney doing the national anthem and you just see how everybody's responding and just the hype about it. I love that video so much. So I thought it was dope that they put that in the movie and kind of highlighted just how that national anthem, you know, just circulated around the world. Like, understand, after Whitney did her version, like, it became a, a, a standard where you had to really, like, kill the song. You couldn't just go up there doing anything. The only other version I can think of that predates Whitney's that, like, had this massive cultural impact would have been Marvin Gaye's um, when he did it at that NBA game. But something about Whitney and, and the power in that voice and just, man, that that's a great one. I'm not even patriotic like that, but let that thing come on. I'm getting ready. <laughs> but, uh... Man, um, one part I thought was sad was the relationship with her and the dad. You know, it was sad that even as the father passed, they were never able to make peace because, you know, he had sued her for a hundred million dollars. Um, and, you know, there was the accusations that he had been stealing the money and all those different things. That part was sad to see. Um, I, I wish they would have been able to work that out. I think, like, you know, they, they, they reference drug usage a lot in this movie. But I don't think they really highlight the origins of what would have kind of triggered somebody to go into those spaces. Like, I think Whitney dealt with a lot of BS from a lot of people. She was often used, um, overly criticized people in her life. And then even again, the conversation with her and Robin and trying to figure out what she wants and are you truly happy? Like, all those kind of things like that, I think, play a role into people's, you know, experience and how they see the world and how they're going to respond to certain things. And so, you know, I, I definitely, I'm not a therapist and I, I didn't live in her world, but I definitely think you know, her father passing and not being able to really quite work it out before he passed, based on what had been reported, maybe they did, but I definitely think that played a role into some of her choices in, in later down the line. Um, the portion where they talk about the My Love Is Your Love tour, what's interesting, in the movie they painted like, oh, Whitney was excited to tour, she couldn't wait to go, but to me looking back, I think Whitney didn't feel like doing that tour. That was a tour that was only done because Whitney needed money. Like, by the time they got to the My Love Is Your Love tour, there was no money around. Like, she was so down bad at that point. Like, you know, the I can't think of the clothing. Uh, was that Versace? I can't remember what clothing guy. Like, he sponsored the tour because she didn't even have clo uh, enough money for uniforms or, or costumes for the tour for the band and everybody. And that's why when you see her on Oprah doing modeling those clothes, that was a part of the deal in order to, you know, get the, uh, a really great discount for all the costumes on that tour. Like, she didn't have any money at that point. And really, Whitney had been touring on and off since 93. Like, she had been on tour every year except, I think, 95, 96. And even those two years, she had a lot of spot dates because it was like she had the, the, the Bodyguard tour, which was like 120 shows. That, sh that tour was way too long, in my opinion. I think that really did some wear and tear on her voice. Um, she had the Pacific Rim tour. She had the European tour. She had all these different spot dates in between where she's in Brunei or she's in all these other different places. And then right after that, she went right into the My Love Is Your Love tour. So she had really been touring on and off for like five or six years. Um, and so I, I found that interesting, but I did like that they, they highlighted it's not right, but it's okay. And I say that because to me, that song represented, like how I said earlier that Whitney started to experiment a bit more artistically. I don't think there was space for Whitney to come out with a power ballad by the time we get to 99, you know, and I, or 98, 99. And I say that because the industry was shifting. It was being pushed a bit more towards a younger audience. Um, I think I referenced this a little bit in my So What Happened with Tony Braxton as well. We talk about by the time Tony gets to the heat era, the industry had shifted because you got to think it's like the teen pop explosion has become a thing. You know, there's been a, a, a deeper merger of R&B and hip hop where there's a lot more collaborative songs where now R&B tends to have a lot of stuff that's very hip hop influenced and vice versa. Um, and so I think it's not right, but it's okay was a great you know, reemergence for Whitney. That's one of the first songs I heard when I moved back to America because I had lived in Europe for a few years. And so I got back to America in the summer of 99. And when I got to America, that was like a really, really big song, both the remix and, and the regular version. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And I always thought the imaging of that was really dope. Very left field for Whitney. For someone who they always made super glamorous and, and like a princess, this is kind of Whitney with some attitude. And, you know, she got the shortcut, the darker lipstick. I'm like, all right, Nippy, we see you. Um, so I thought that was dope. Um, like I said, I've already kind of talked about the drugs. That part got on my nerves because I, I understand it's a part of her story. They're going to put it in there. 
as a fan, that's the part you want to act like didn't happen. Um, but I will say, I think what I liked about the ending, and, and it, they hinted through this hinted this throughout the movie was I love that they utilize the American Music Awards performance where she does the three songs um what is that I love you Porgy and then um I have nothing and um and I'm telling you what I always liked about that performance is at that point in time Whitney was starting to get a little bit of critique about her voice because she was starting to be sick a lot um or have to cancel shows because you know sore vocal cords this that and third and so between about 94 and maybe 97 ish her voice was up and down. Like people always talk about, oh, her voice declined and it was, it was in the end when she lost it. But her voice was tired during the mid 90s because she had done so much touring. And again, somebody like Whitney does not have easy songs to sing. Like Whitney doesn't have a catalog where she gets that song where she's like, oh, I can relax on this one. No, because every song is a powerhouse vocal. You know, you give good love, saving all my love for you. How will I know? Greatest love of all. I want to dance with somebody. Didn't we almost have it all? So emotional. Where do broken hearts go? I will always like all of these songs are these big dynamic vocals. There's not a Whitney song in her catalog where she can just do something real light. Like the easiest song for her to sing was probably Shoop. And even Shoop still has the big note at the end. And so imagine singing all these big powerful songs for two hours a night for like five years. Your voice is exhausted. And so, you know, around that time of that performance, she was starting to get some smoke about her voice. And it would only get worse as we got into like 95, 96. People gave her a lot of smoke for her um, Grammy performance when they did the, the um, medley with everybody from Waiting to Excel because her voice, she was tired. There was no power in her voice that night. So, you know, I love this performance because it, it highlighted the stamina that Whitney had as a performer. You know, it's like a nine minute performance and it's a very hard bit for her to sing. Even in the movie, they reference it like, you want me to go even higher? And, and mind you, at the time that she had done that, this is the end of the Bodyguard tour. Understand that an artist that does the kind of singing that Whitney does, doing a tour for uh, for almost two years your voice gets darker it gets heavier she also just had a child understand when you you have children your voice changes and so you know whitney is you know now a bit older getting into her 30s and is still expected to sing these songs the same way she performed them when she was 21 and stuff like that so that performance i love that that was the performance they highlighted and, and closed the film with because it just showed the stamina that she had and just how much power was in her voice and just the gift that was there. And it's something that not everybody is blessed with. And I think that's what made Whitney Whitney is, you know, Whitney had these magical moments where she could just clean house on the stage. And so I love that they used that performance because I just knew they were going to use, I don't know, the Welcome Home Heroes performance of All the Man That I Need with the Red Dress. That's the one everybody goes up for. But, you know, she has so many really, really great, you know, moments. Um, Towards, I know they also, they, they referenced the, the last album era, the I Look To You, and they kind of briefly talk about the tour and how the voice had gone out and stuff, and they used the I Didn't Know My Own Strength performance from Oprah. Personally, I would have used the Italy X Factor of Million Dollar Bill as that performance. Um, I, the Oprah one was cool, but I think in, in, as a fan, my favorite performance of her last era would have been the Italy X Factor. She was just in really good voice. There was power. She looked happy. And Italy was a place that really loved it. Um, Whitney as well like that was that was a really really strong market for her and so um, you know I probably would have used that performance instead of, I didn't know my own strength to kind of highlight the I look to you era um, the ending I guess um, as far as them referencing her dying in the tub but I did like that they closed it with the AMA performance from 94 I did like that overall I think the movie's okay I just I don't know if it really does what it needs to do I, I, I will say out of all the Whitney movies it's the better one you know, I think there's been three, maybe four Whitney movies at this point. Um, I, I think this was the best one. And like I said, I think as far as the execution, it's executed well with what is presented. I just think the script should have been written differently. Um, but I think Naomi did a great job. And like I said, that's a hard, those are some hard shoes to fill. Um, the highlights for me, using Whitney's voice, I thought was really good. I will say the costume, even though they had everything mixed up and had the ears thrown in mixed together, kind of seeing them re, you know, replicate some of the music videos, like How Will I Know? or it's not right but it's okay it was pretty cool I, I really enjoyed that entire national anthem scene with how they just captured the essence of that that was really really good um you know there, there's just some things in there that um I, I wish they would have had more of but really like i said this should have been a series not a movie you just can't capture whitney's career in two hours you just can't you know so and this let this be listen if y'all do a prince movie i'm telling y'all now make it a series he that man got 856 albums you can't do prince in two hours 
you know, if, if they ever give Janet a movie, she needs a series as well. Two hours isn't enough to capture her life. You can make a whole movie just off the Super Bowl and the backlash with that. You know, um, I don't know if they're ever going to do another Michael movie. But if they do a Michael movie, same thing. Michael would need a series. Um, you know, these, these big entertainers. Stevie Wonder, if he ever gets a movie, he needs a series. You know, all these great legends and these big giant artists that had these careers that people can only dream about. I'm a fan of a series. Really, I'm more so, I, I like the idea of a documentary even more. But if you're going to do a movie, you know, go all out. But I, I think for what it was, it, it's cool. It's entertaining. I, I just wish there would, they would have filled a few of the gaps. And I just wish they did a better job of really capturing what it is that Whitney brought to the table. I think it's there. But you don't leave with an understanding that Whitney is one of the, the most successful entertainers in the world. I don't think you leave with that. And I don't think you leave with the fact that her voice is a, a voice that is studied by literally every singer. She's your singer's favorite singer. So, you know, anyway, if you've seen the movie, share your two cents. If you didn't see the movie, you don't plan on seeing it, share your two cents anyway. Anyway, I'm out. Subscribe.